Good morning, everybody, and welcome back to the channel. It's Tuesday. We're on the backup channel, of course. Caught a strike. Uh, I think it was like Saturday, and so we're kicked off there for a week. So here's where we'll be at least till Monday. First of all, I want to thank God for this channel and all of our channels. And I want to thank God for all of you as well. You guys are amazing that you find us wherever we're at. And God is amazing, isn't he? He always sustains us no matter what we're going through. He always finds a way to keep us all together, to keep us connected, and to help us deal with life's problems as they come. So we're here today to talk about a few obscure passages in the Bible that mention Babylon the Great, which is widely known by many sources as the world false religion. And I spent a lot of time in churches for much of my early life, and each one would accuse the others of being that Babylon empire of false religion. Usually what you see is the Protestant denominations accusing the Catholics of being Babylon the Great, of false religion. And I'm not sure what the Catholics do because I've never been a Catholic, so I don't know what their take is on what that scripture means. But this is what is said in the Bible. So that's what we're going to talk about today. Here's 2 Timothy 3, 5, talking about a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. From such turn away. And this is talking about false religions as well, who claim to have the power of God, but there is no power in what they're doing. And we see that in today's church, don't we? So, I believe that the definition of the true false religion are the very rules that define religion according to the iris tax beast. Now, for the purposes of today's show, we're going to refer to the service of revenue that's internal. We're going to call it iris, like the iris of your eye. Because for some reason, they're sensitive about that topic, and probably rightfully so. Now, up to this point, most people believe that their Christian denomination is the true religion, right? This is what they've been told as they point the finger at other denominations as the false prophet, as the false religion. And denominations spend a lot of time talking about this from the pulpit, don't they? Finger pointing. Well, I believe that this is a case of the kettle calling the pot black. And we'll get into that as the show progresses today. But here's my question. Can you really be a true religion if you don't stand up for what's most important to God? Can you really be a true religion if you cave in to what men tell you to do? Now, as many of you know, my mother is JW, and they've long prided themselves as one of the only true Christian religions is what they claim. And the reason why is because they have a litmus test for what we're supposed to do as a true Christian. And they take it very literally. And they say that they're in charge of spreading the gospel, preaching the word to the entire world. So they they have a lot of uh, mechanisms in place to very, very accurately count how many languages that they that they put the publications into all the lands that they go into. And they keep count of all the people that have been covered. They have a system of accounting that is I've never seen before. Because they take it seriously. And even they, and when I, when I saw this, I was shocked. Even they compromised their most prized belief. And they're no longer knocking on doors right now because of you know what. Now, of course, they'll spin that to claim that they're protecting people by not putting them at risk. But their protocol seems to veer in the opposite direction from the example that Jesus set, doesn't it? Now, I'm not criticizing any one religion 
because you're going to, as you're going to see, they're all complicit. They're complicit by the very definition of what it means to be a religion according to Iris, the Iris. Now, the enemy is about control. And let me give you a story here. I was researching deer hunting. Let me go back in here and so I can watch you guys as we're talking about this. I was researching deer hunting. And every year, each person who likes to hunt will, is given two deer tags. That's it. That's all you get. No more. And this would be far short of what would be necessary to sustain a family. There's a specific deer season. Now I understand the inner workings of how that works. There's a season where you should be able to harvest them and other seasons they might be, you know, um, you know, mating and all this, all these things or pregnant. And so you don't want to make a mistake. I get all of that. But. Every hunter has to register. So they have a list of every single man, woman, and child who gets given a deer tag. So you are now on a registry. And once you take a deer, you have to report that. Now, it makes it great when you want to look up information on how many deer are taken each year. And it's somewhere in the millions. I think I misspoke on a previous show and I thought there were only 279,000 deer that were taken. But it's actually in the millions. It's far more than are taken out in roadkill but the point i'm trying to make here is the mechanism of control 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 and that's what it's really all about now if deer were almost extinct and it was a protected species i could see doing something like this it would kind of make sense right because if man can't be good stewards of our resources then i could see some body coming in and you know helping to stop the extinction of deer, for instance. But they're not extinct. In fact, there's too many. In fact, every year, they double their population, according to some studies. And like I said, over almost half a million become roadkill every year. And nobody bats an eye at that. Nobody thinks twice about that. So it's not about preserving the animal. It's about control. Now, why are we talking about deer and hunting? Well, because you would be shocked at all the rules that religions have to go by, which puts them under the control of man, puts them under the control of governments, to be specific. And if they break these rules, they lose their tax exemption and they go broke. No church of any size can stay a church if they lose their tax-exempt status. It's almost impossible for them to stay afloat. Now, I'm going to even take it a step further today. But I'm going to assert that there are rich and powerful men who attach themselves to these denominations or even are at the top in full control of these denominations who use religion, use the church to wash their money. You heard me correctly. Washing money, which has to do with laundering, laundry. Now, so you might be asking, Casey, if this was really happening, wouldn't this be front page news? Well, no, because it has become part of the very foundation of America. It's been, I don't know how long this has been going on, but it is going on right under our noses, under the guise of a charity. One of the number one ways to wash your money in America and it's happening in plain sight and people don't bat an eye. Now, how does this work? Well, there's a show out called Ozarks. And if you really want to know how this happens, how people like you and me stay oppressed in America while the rich keep getting richer and richer and richer and don't pay any taxes, watch that show because it spells it out for you. So what happens in the series Ozarks? Well, there's a guy named Marty. And he's just a, a lowly accountant. And he finds out that his partner is helping out this organized crime syndicate to launder money. And he doesn't even realize that that's going on. Well, they're about to take him out. 
They take out his friend and they're going to take him out too. Marty's life is under threat. So he brokers a deal with them and he says, look, I'll keep the operation going. You need me, right? How are you going to wash this money? And they give him two weeks to figure out a plan to do it. So what does Marty do? He moves to the Ozarks. And he sets up a money washing operation. Now, what is required for a money washing operation? You need lots and lots and lots of cash. Uh, can anyone say collection plate? Now, any one church during a Sunday collection probably isn't going to have tons and tons of money. Maybe a few hundred, three, four hundred, maybe a thousand bucks. If you're in a mega church, you know, maybe maybe a couple thousand dollars going to the collection plate. If you've got two or three or four or five hundred people in the pews. But then what happens is you multiply that times all of the churches holding service that Sunday that are associated with that denomination. And now you're in easily into the millions of dollars and possibly into the tens of millions of dollars every single Sunday. Now, that cash is then, effect, is then in effect flying in the wind. It's not tracked. And the value of it can't be accurately written down because it's all based on trusting the person who's collecting it to accurately write down how much was collected. And that number then can be changed. And that cash could then end up anywhere. Now, according to the series, Ozarks, they mix in the dirty cash with the clean cash. And voila, you have washed money. So that's how it's done. Now, Marty in the series is attracted to businesses that receive a lot of cash. Restaurants and churches. Those are the two places he goes to in the series to wash the money. And he does improvements, but then he pays people cash and then so on and so forth. Now, here's the problem. You and I, people like you and I, get lumped in to this policing of all of this, which rarely ever gets exposed. When's the last time you heard a restaurant going down for washing money? When's the last time you heard in the news of a church going down for washing money? You never hear it because it never happens. It's almost like they allow it to happen. So what about restaurants? Well, restaurants... They barely break even, most of them. And if you ever notice a restaurant that isn't making any money, no one ever goes there. And you're like, how are these people paying their rent? How are these people keeping the doors open? They stay open for years and years and years. The same restaurant. Well, they may be washing money for somebody. Now, how does it work? Well, in the series, a person who wants to wash money, they approach an existing a restaurant owner. They typically don't start their own because that could attract too much attention and it would be in their name. So they typically go in and try to be a co-owner with a restaurant. They then offer to run the restaurant, help it, you know, make some improvements, and then they start washing the money. Now, churches work in almost exactly the same way. And so if you start to see really, really rich people hanging around a church that don't give too much information about themselves, but you see them kind of filtering around, they may be using the church to wash their money. Now, if you think all of this is conjecture and silly, I've seen it. I've seen it in my own churches that I've been to over the years. The bigger the church, the more money you can wash. You know, it's funny, the things that we see early in our lives that kind of stick in our minds. They didn't make sense back then, but all of a sudden now they're crystal clear. I'll tell you another story. I attended a church for years and years and was friends with one of the members. Guess what he did for a living? He was an Iris tax auditor who also just so happened to be the church treasurer. Now, what are the odds of that? Was he looking the other way? 
Was this just a coincidence? Unreal. Now, how else, now how does this actually apply to what's going on right now? And what we're going to talk about today? And why would the IRS do this? Why would they basically hold someone's tax exempt status? Well, it's about control. It's about sealing the lips of the church. And that is priceless to the government. Priceless. What better way to control someone than to seal their lips? So you see, the church has had a mask on for much longer and long before CV-19. You know, a lot of people believe in God and go to church in this country. And to control those people, they hang money as a carrot to the people that run the church. And I here's the thing, if they if the churches were really doing God's work and calling out hypocrisy and evil, then things would be drastically different in America, wouldn't it? this whole social takeover that we're experiencing right now. It wouldn't be happening. Wars wouldn't be fought. The taking of the life in the womb wouldn't be happening. And overall, God would have the numbers that he needed of the faithful that would overtake the devil's agenda. But you see, God already knew this wouldn't happen. He already knew that the whole world would be in the power of the wicked one. Why? Because the wicked one holds the money. He made the money system, the economic system. Now, I'm going to play this clip for those of you that tuned in early from the series Evil. And so how does this work? Well, tax-exempt status, in order to have it as a church, you have to meet several requirements. And they illustrate it well in this series called evil and i've collected some clips from the one of the latest episodes in which there are these investigators for the catholic church and what do they do they look into claims of sainthood they look into paranormal activity they resolve conflicts within the church and we've talked a little bit about this series you guys have seen some clips but this particular episode the iris service of taxes reaches out to the Catholic Church because they want them to investigate the claims of 501c3 tax exemption by a startup company or startup religion who worships the devil. So they the 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 iris reaches out to them and they investigate this new startup religion. Now, the irony here, as you will see illustrated, is that many of the accusations that the Catholic Church makes against this startup religion is the very things that they're doing. Let's take a look at this. And what does the IRS base its decision on? Four criteria. No substantial part of the church's activities should be about influencing legislation or politics. So, can't influence legislation or politics. Now, I, I can already hear it now. The T supporters are going to say, well, didn't T change that? Well, if he did, why is the verbiage that we're going to look at in a minute on the website still up? So it's selective, right? So you really don't know if they're going to look the other way or not. Let's keep going. Really? Three, the organization's purposes may not be illegal. Okay, this is the part we're going to get in today. E being illegal. And this is what we're going to break down. Because that word carries a lot of weight. What is the definition of illegal? That's what we're going to look at. We're going to look at tax code. And you're going to be shocked at what our churches, quote unquote, 
have been under for the last several decades. Now, as we go through this, understand that you should be able to ask a simple question of your pastor if they are 501c3. And we're going to have an action plan when we get to the end of this. If you're a person who feels betrayed by what you're about to see next, let's keep watching because there are more requirements. Two, the net earnings may not inure to the benefit of one person. So in other words, one person can't make all the money and put it in their pockets from any net benefits. So they allow churches to have profits. Even though they're a nonprofit, you just heard her say net benefits. The organization must be operated exclusively for worshiping a deity or deities. It is that the organization actually believes in it. The nature of that deity is not in question. So they have to worship a deity. They don't care which God you worship. And by the very definition of everything that you just heard, they ain't worshiping the real God. So you have basically all of these false gods being worshipped because by definition, there shouldn't be money in God's temple. That's why Jesus threw the money out of the church, did he not? But it would be helpful if you could guide the IRS to see that it doesn't deserve tax exempt status. What? So they want, he wants his team to go in to this startup Satan worshiping church and try to basically dismiss them, disqualify them and prove them liars so that they lose their tax exempt status. Now, the question in this episode is why did the IRS, why do they care? Why did they come to the Catholic church to have them dig into this? Well, because they don't want people established as religions because that's less taxes that they're going to get. But they'd rather have control and muzzle you and give you that tax-exempt status as a church. They'd rather do that than basically, I guess the words are, let you go on your own and then become a force to be reckoned with with the government. I think that is what the true purpose of this is. So let me give you an example. Let's say a very charismatic speaker, you know, put uh, basically sets up a concert of some type and he shows up to a stadium and he fills the entire stadium with a hundred thousand people and word gets out that this guy is the truth. And next thing you know, he's got 17 million or 20 million people on his social media page. And let's say this guy is the real deal, you know, he's been given a gift to expose the enemy and so, but he's not tax exempt yet. Well, let's say, so what was the, what will the iris try to do? Well, they're going to try to control that person, aren't they? How do you control them? You offer them exempt status, but then in doing that, they can't do certain things. And we're going to get into that in a minute. Now, why would that person want to have tax exempt status? Well, everyone has to live their life, right? So the person might think that they're doing something good by having that tax exempt status. But if they were really to look at what they, the rules that would be placed on them, they would decline it. But it's a big giant carrot because people let their egos get the best of them. They let their egos and they see money symbols. Do they not? And so the true test of a person to know what they're about at their core. To know who they serve is do they take the tax exempt carrot? Right? Because once you take the carrot. There are three quarters of what you should be doing for God you won't be able to do. Plain and simple. Now, I'm going to show you that in documentation, but I want to get through this, these clips that I put together for you guys. Let's make sure you guys are here. Okay, good. All right, let's keep going with this. So you want us to stop it from being tax exempt? We don't determine that. What if they actually 
believe in Satan. Belief is the greatest hurdle to tax-exempt status. You pray a lot? Three times a day, morning, noon, and night. Are they answered? Oh, yeah. So this is the team. They're at the Satanic Church. And obviously, the guy's just washing money. And they know it. But they got to prove it, right? There's so much wrong with this, with this episode. You've got churches ratting each other out, right? They don't want competition. You've got, they're all liars. All of them are lying. And it's crazy. If we have time at the end of the show, I want to show you an iris building from Google Earth. And it actually looks like an iris. Let's keep watching. Yeah, our father below controls the world, so I get exactly what I want. Is this church involved in politics, or can it be implied that it is? You mean unlike the Catholic church? You pray a lot? Three times a day, morning, noon, and night. Are they answered? Oh, my enemies harmed. Uh, no gray hair, no acne, parking spaces. Are your prayers answered? The key is to not look biased against their beliefs. We have to use the language of the IRS. So, clearly, they're basically letting the cat out of the bag. Now, what is the purpose of this? Why would this episode be telling us all this? Well, think about it. You're watching this episode, and all of a sudden, you get a bad taste in your mouth. You realize just how many claws Iris has into all Christian religions. And that's exactly how they designed it. They designed it to take down one day. They designed it to fail. You can't call yourself a real Christian and be tax exempt. And I'm going to show you, well, I keep saying that, but just keep on watching here. So this is your established place of worship? Yes. One of the IRS requirements. And we're most proud of our statue of Baphomet. A distinct membership? Oh, we doubled our membership in uh, two months. Yeah, from what to what? No, I'd have to check those numbers. Do you have regular service? We do. When? Notice they require membership. Now, this is interesting. Because I was in a church for many years, and every time I would leave one, they would say, do you want to transfer your membership? It's all about this membership, membership. Does that sound like what Jesus set up for us in terms of the true church? An accounting of who all the members are? That's for iris purposes, not purposes of God. They always do the opposite of the truth, right? They say there's a separation between church and state, but there really isn't. The church and the state are all linked in together. Friday, 8 p.m., join us. And here is some of our literature. What? You have to have literature, another requirement. So notice how the church you probably go to probably has some kind of printed literature. That's a requirement. When they get audited, that you have to show that to them. What's your creed? Do what you want, unless it hurts someone. You seem very aware of what we need. Oh. Now, I thought it was interesting, the fact that you need printed literature is that, like, some denominations like the JWs were founded around printing literature. That was how they started leaflets, pamphlets. They've got their own printing presses. And so this begins to peel back something that isn't quite on the up and up. Oh, I've been reading the IRS literature. I have to clear that tax exempt bar. Satan, all glory. Destroy them. How? Not in any way that would break the laws of the United States. If someone presents themselves as your adversary, destroy them. And look for rewards now, not after. You're just co-opting the devil to get press and piss off religious people. And tax-exempt status. And looking for new members. This is blasphemy. Now this guy is the real devil. And he even's like, this is crazy. He's like, they don't really believe in the devil. They're just washing money. What are you smiling about? These idiots don't believe in Satan. So, those are some clips from the show Evil. Now this is a weird show. I would not recommend watching it. It's very dark. There's like nightmare scenarios and stuff like that. But I needed to show you that so you can understand what's really going on. So, now we've established that the, the way that governments control the church 
is so that they don't get involved in politics. And that's because Christianity represents the single largest voting bloc in America. I'll say that again. Christianity represents the single largest voting bloc in America. In other words, if there was one main Protestant church, let's say all the little Protestant churches combined and consolidated, and there was one man, a real man of God, who did the right thing, like a disciple type, then the devil would lose all his power in America because he, all of the people in that voting block would vote in a person or vote that person in to lead the country, right? So in effect, with this rule that we're going to read by Iris, they've essentially chopped off the hands of the disciples in Jesus. Now, what is the rule? Well, we talked about it has to be legal. These are IRS documents. I said the word. Political lobbying and activities. This one in particular, as you can see here. Contrary to public policy. Activities that are illegal or contrary to public policy. These are the key words here. Contrary to public policy policy and this is why the churches did not stand up this is why they did not stand up in the midst of what is happening to us right now i'm going to read some parts of this iris document now before we do some people might argue well that's why we vote conservative, because we know that they believe in God. So we as a church, once again, give all of our power over to a single man to determine the fate of God's will. Think about how much more powerful the church could be if they didn't have this censorship hanging over their head. Some people might argue, well, Casey, we do what we can. And if we have to play by the rules to be able to hold services and gather together, that, that, then that's all we can do. And here's what I say. God calls that lukewarm. And what does he do with lukewarm? He spits it out. You know, it's funny. I hear my Christian brothers and sisters bravely talk about how gladly we'll lose our heads for our Messiah. But yet we cower in fear to call out church corruption and government control in our churches. We let our church leaders off the hook. These churches are corporations, that's all. Money washing schemes. And other people might say, well, Casey, no big deal. We stay out of politics. Voting isn't what we think anyway, so they can keep it. Well, all this control and censorship goes down another level. As a church, you cannot discuss or be involved in these activities that are contrary to public policy. So, all these laws that we claim to not agree with, right? The church will not make a stand on because of the threat of losing their tax exempt status. I can think of five right off the top of my head. The taking of the life in the stomach of a woman is a legal thing. Can't preach against it. War is legal. Can't preach against it. Mandatory stickers are legal in many states. Can't preach against it. Marriage between two people of the same flavor is legal. Can't preach against it. What happens when they lower the age of consent? Or what happens when it's federally mandated universal stickers? Can't preach against it. Or what happens when these harsh sustainability laws come into effect and they end all hunting and fishing and living in the land and on and on and on. Can you see the problem? The church has no teeth. 
Now, I'm sure some of you have heard pastors occasionally preach on some of the topics that I just listed, but notice that it never gains traction. It never becomes the focus. It never becomes a force. It's never effective. It never goes anywhere. It's here and there. There is no single voice condemning certain things. And it's because it's all by design. You can't serve two masters. Notice that no matter how hard YT tries to censor us, we just keep speaking in different tongues, don't we? And I'm proud of each and every one of you who is bold in your belief. Because the modern church that say they are so organized are actually disorganized. Babylon the Great. Now I'll attach this particular document and all the rest of these so you can see this for yourself. And I want you to print it out. And I want you to write a note on the bottom that says, if you can't speak against anything contrary to public policy, then what good are you to God? And then I want you to mail it to someone in a place of authority in a church. And when you get an answer back, if you get an answer back, I would like to hear what they have to say about this. So this is pub I to the R to the S. Let's see what they have to say here. The purpose, okay, violation of constitutionally valid laws is inconsistent with exemption under 501c3 as a matter of trust law, one of the main sources of the general law of charity. Planned activities that violate laws are not in furtherance of a charitable purpose. A trust cannot be created for a purpose which is illegal. The purpose is illegal if the trust tends to induce the commission of a crime or if the accomplishment of the purpose is otherwise against public policy. So, public policy. A lot of public policies, aren't there? So, this is very damaging. Because this basically puts it all out there. Now, this is maybe the first time you've heard of anything like this. But here it is in black and white. Here it is in black and white. Now... This is a long document, so we're not going to go through all this. But once I check in with you guys, maybe we'll go into Google Earth and look up this building. Let's take a look here. From the sky. Now, this is we're just visually looking at the building. That's all we're doing here. We just want to see what it looks like. You know telling anyone to go do anything. You have to state that now. Oh, is it even going to open? Let's see if it opens. For some reason, Google Earth does not want to open right now. Probably they know I'm about to expose them. Never had that happen before. Try to open up Google Earth and it won't open while we're live. Uh, but we did a show on it years ago. <laughs> So for those of you that saw that show, you will remember that we pulled up this building from the sky and it was literally shaped like the a, a cross section of the iris of the eye. And at the base of it was a church, a very small church. So we won't be able to look at it today. Maybe I should have opened Google Earth before we, uh, before we went live and it might have worked. But anyway, let's go into the chat here for a little bit. Now, tomorrow we'll be back with Between the Headlines. And here it is here. We've got all these stories pulled up. Lots of new information. We're going to talk about what happened to Facebook. We're going to talk about everything that's been going on. And the updates. We're going to talk about going beefless. This is the goal. That's what they're saying. They're blaming the cows for this global warming. So they're going to punish us by taking away our hamburgers. 
I mean, not that I recommend that people should be eating hamburgers every day, but it is a right that we have, right? So, we are the church not made by hands. Absolutely, Victoria. You don't need a building to go to church. We're in church right now. Do we have a building? No. Are we 501c3? No. We're having church right now. We don't need their dumb tax exempt status. All right. Yeah, Facebook was down for several hours. We're going to cover that tomorrow in between the headlines. Okay. Yeah, there's a lot of protests going on across the world. Mainstream media typically won't cover it. They just don't. And so it's hard for people to come together in unity when they think that no one else is. So... Yes, the church is the assembled body. Think about it. What did what did Jesus do? He was a carpenter, yet he never built the church. I think that was the irony that God was trying to show us. That's why he came as a carpenter. To say, look, if he wanted to, he could have built the best and coolest church ever. And it would have stood for generations and generations. And people could say, wow, that was built with Jesus' hands. Right? And think of how many people could have been converted. By It would be like the, the wall, the wailing wall. It would be somewhere on the order of that kind of status. And even more so, because it would have been built by the hands of Jesus and his disciples. Right? He could have spent all of his time building a church that everyone came to, but he didn't. What did he do? He went out and walked around. Now he did go into churches and synagogues that were existing, but he spent most of his time in the countryside and the landscape. He only went into those churches to challenge them or debate them or to preach occasionally. But that was not the focus of his ministry. That was not the focus of his ministry. So why is that a requirement to have exempt status? Why do you have to have a building? See the problem here? That is the problem. It's about control. Always has been. The enemy rules this world. It isn't until God's kingdom comes that all that will change. This kingdom will be brought to ruin. It will be crushed. And God's new kingdom will be in effect. A perfect kingdom. So, don't get too attached to this place. Okay? I know a lot of us have been through a lot. You know, when they hit me at this strike, at first, for like 30 seconds, I got mad. I'm like, how much more do we have to do? To continue to have a voice. I mean, in turn, we're like one of the, we don't, I don't know. I was upset. And then I said, you know what? That's the enemy trying to steal our joy, isn't it? The enemy's trying to steal our joy and we can't let him do that. Because then it would be the same as the churches, wouldn't it? So we have to be different. We have to stand strong and bold and just change the way we talk about things. Not give in and just seal our lips and muzzle ourselves. All right. What else do we have? Going to the chat. Yes. Tear down this temple and I'll raise it up in three days. The temple was the body. Resurrection. So. Someone doesn't have sound. wonder why. Uh, hit the mute button, Sunflower Shine. Maybe something you actually hit the mute button. Yep, Tanya. Ain't nothing gonna steal my joy. So, this is something you can tell people. This is a very important topic, you guys, because we will come under attack in these last days. People will try to criticize us. And guess what they're gonna do? They're gonna try to throw the kitchen sink at you. They're going to try to compare you to the pre-established church that's basically was set up for destruction. 
Because that's what it is. If you, I could see it a mile away. All of this was set up to come down. And that's why they set it up this way. It has no real power. And so, this is why they designed it this way. And, so what are we going to do? Well, when someone challenges you and they say, religion is responsible for most of the death in history, say, that wasn't my religion. Most people killed in the name of God. That wasn't my God that they were worshiping. That's, that's not true Christianity. That's what you tell them. You have to be able to come back at them with this. That Those people weren't worshiping the true God. You have to be able to say that with boldness. And I'm not part of that, those religions. I'm not religious. I'm spiritual. I believe in the Bible. I believe in the Most High and everything that the Bible taught. Well, uh, the Bible was written by men. Uh, the Bible is one of the oldest documents in human history written across 40 authors across the span of thousands of years, yet it all has perfect continuity. And it was copied by men, but it was written by many men and is basically a living, breathing miracle. That's what you tell people when they tell you the Bible is written by men. And why isn't the church giving us these tools? Because they were never meant to give you the tools to speak back against the devil. They were made to make you feel helpless and just say, oh, I just have faith that God loves me and I have faith in my religion. Those are my beliefs and that's it. You have to be able to come back at these people when they challenge you like this. Otherwise, they will crush that little voice inside of you over time. You will start to believe them. You will believe the lie. You will believe the lie. You also have to ask yourself, you know, if they ask you, well, oh, the Bible is written by men. The Bible is the single most published and copied and reproduced document in the entire planet. The entire calendar is based off of when Jesus was born into this world. There are many ways to contradict the lies of the enemy. Okay? We just have to be able to do it. We just have to be able to do it. So, interesting, right? Interesting. And when they criticize modern church, say, that's not my church. I can be a Christian without going to a building with a guy who flies on private jets and who is basically taking all people's money and then using it to wash money. I'm not part of that. That's their church. We're part of the real church. We don't need a building. We don't need a building. So, all you need is your Bible. And God has preserved his word in ancient scrolls from thousands of years ago that haven't been changed since they were written down. That's a miracle within itself. Did you know that through the Dark Ages they tried to erase the Bible? But even through then, they retained the original copies and the, the Bible has been translated and copied many, many times over. We went through a period of hundreds of years where all we had were modern copies of the Bible in that particular time frame, right? So if it was like 500 AD, they had Bible copies. But there was a whole piece of history where they didn't have the ancient copies. You catch my drift of what I'm trying to tell you here? And so, lo and behold, in the 1940s, these ancient copies of the Bible resurfaced. They were found in a cave. God preserved his word. And guess what happened? A miracle. They pulled those ancient scrolls written right around, I guess many of them were written before the time of Jesus. Old Testament, written before the time of Jesus. And they compared them to the contemporary or modern copies. And there was, it was almost verbatim. Nothing had been changed. That's a miracle. That is a miracle. 
I'm probably not explaining that very well. But it, what it says is that it hadn't been changed, that God had preserved his word. Now, there are parts of the Bible that are mistranslated. And that's where you got to be careful. What do you mean by that, Casey? Well, they put different words in for what the word should be. Someone gave me a good example. They told me, Casey, God, he does evil too. I go, no, he doesn't. They go, look in Isaiah 42. So I looked in Isaiah 42. Let me show you this. Let's go into Isaiah 42. Why won't Google Earth open? Oh, well. Someone's like, go in Isaiah 42. God does darkness. God creates darkness. I go, no, he doesn't. God is good all the time. That would be a contradiction of scripture, right? I think it's, I think it's Isaiah 42. Might be Isaiah 45. Let's go in here. Get seven. Oh, here we go. Ready for this? This is what you got to be careful of. That's why you always have to use a concordance. When there's a scripture that doesn't make sense to you, go into the concordance. Don't just accept the criticisms of the enemy. Don't just accept what some person that doesn't even know the Bible tells you. Look for yourself to open the blind eyes, to bring out the prisoners from the prison, and that sit in darkness. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Am I in the wrong scripture? Okay, let's go up here. I think it's here. Uh, hold on. Something about darkness. Let me find it. Back up. Hold on. Might be a different uh, verse. Okay, so I think it says create darkness. Let's let's see if we can find that. Okay, let's find that. Create. So this word create can mean to shut down as well. Or to snuff out or come against. It doesn't always mean to make is the point I was trying to make. I wish I knew that verse. Maybe it was 45. But anyway, you guys know the scripture. All you got to do is go into this concordance and it will tell you the truth. It will set things straight. But if you just believe the way that it was translated, you will get discouraged. You will think, oh, well, that's kind of weird. Why would God do bad things to people? No, he doesn't. Okay. So that's just one example. So I, that's why I always recommend a concordance. Now all this is, this site here, it's a concordance site. And it's all right here so you don't have to flip through a book. That's all this is, okay? This is the Holy Scripture. And it's got the concordance here so you can put your cursor over these words and see exactly how the words are translated. If you were to click on it, it would open that word up and so show you how that particular Aramaic or Hebrew word was translated in other verses. So you can compare and contrast and then use the Holy Spirit to find out what the true meaning of that verse is. Let's find this while we're live here. Maybe it was 45, 7. Okay. Here it is, right here. Okay. I form the light and I create darkness. Does God really create darkness? I make peace and I create evil. So someone's like, see, God creates evil. He's both. Let's look at this word create. It could also mean cut down. So does he cut down darkness? Does he cut down evil? I think that would be a better interpretation of this scripture. Now, why would the biblical translators make such a mistake? Well, 
because man is man. Jots and tittles. Know the warning that God gave not to change his word, a jot or a tittle? Well, why did he do that warning? Why did he give that warning? Because he knew. He knew what people would be up to. And he knew that these little, little errors would cause people's head to scratch. And it would cause him to start to doubt God, you see. So, interesting, right? Cut down. Did he, Does he create it or did he cut it down? I believe he cut it down. Because that's what God does. He cuts down evil, doesn't he? So, anyway, hopefully that's helpful. I always like to give you guys tools. Because as we get into these last days, we're coming on under more and more severe attack, are we not? Are we not being criticized for our faith? We are, aren't we? We are being criticized for our faith. We're actually being challenged for our faith, aren't we? These exemptions and things are being denied. Guess what? If you file an exemption and you're not part of a 501c3 church, chances are they might not fulfill your exemption. So in other words... They're saying that your church is illegitimate if it's not under their control. What's the first thing they're going to do if you're part of a church and you file a medical exemption or a religious exemption? What are they going to do? They're going to go to your church and they're going to say, wait a minute. This is why churches aren't giving out these exemptions. Because what is the, what is the iris going to do? They're going to go to that church and they're going to say, are you speaking out against Things that are lawful? Are you really doing that? Because if you are, uh, we can take your tax exempt status. Now you know why churches aren't handing out exemption or exemptions, religious exemptions, because that even puts their 501c3 status under threat, doesn't it? And now you're starting to see the whole picture of how they have the churches shackled, literally. shackled they've got them in a loop they've got them right where they want them get a phone call from the iris hey we got um we've got about 30 people that you tried to write um religious religious exemptions for from this church and we just want to double check that because you know this was a mandate by the president that these employers, you know, over 100 employees have to um, get all of their people stickered, right? So are you doing something? Are you promoting activities that are unlawful? Because if you are, then if you're going against public policy, then you're in danger of losing your tax-exempt status. Contrary to public policy. I'm not making this up, you guys. I'm just trying to get you to think outside the box and understand what's really happening here. Because there's this big white elephant in the room. We're like, how did all the churches give in to this? Number one. And why can't we get our churches to write us an exemption letter? Now you know why. Now you know why. Now someone said not all churches are 501c3. The vast majority are. Once you have... Uh, several hundred people come into your church. I can almost guarantee you. Now, there's a site you can look up. To, uh, tax exempt status of all your churches. You would be shocked. You might even be lied to. Your pastor might say, no, we're not 501c3. Go look it up on the website. Don't take anyone's word for it. Your hands are tied. As soon as you register with them, their, their faces are muzzled. Yes, money is the root of all evil. And that's why Jesus threw it out of the temple because he knew this was going to happen. He knew that the governments would get their hooks in these churches and that they would basically not be able to serve Jesus anymore. Not in any real way. Yeah, they help people. Yeah, they spread the gospel. But you notice something. You notice, yes, we should be focused on the gospel. But that wasn't the only part of the good news. That wasn't the only part of what Jesus came to do and told us to do. Think about all of the 
prophets who didn't even have a gospel to talk about, who prophesied against their kings. This isn't just about the gospel. And that's why the churches try to focus on it. And that's why they tell you to shut up about everything else, don't they? Don't talk about that. Don't follow in or the stars. He's, he doesn't even talk about the gospel very much. Don't follow him. Because there's nothing they can do about it. Because they know they've been exposed. They know they can't talk about all the things we talk about on here. And so they just want you to shut up. Jennifer says, my pastor has 51C3. He was arrested for keeping church tax exemptions. Wow. I think Jennifer's got a channel, a channel, I believe. Good channel. Go check out Jennifer's channel. So um, that's what's going on, you guys. That's what's really going on. You have to read between the lines about all this stuff. It's crazy. So I love you guys and I thank you for tuning in. And we'll be here tomorrow with Between the Headlines. And of course, we'll have to be very careful. We won't be able to read comments on some of these stories. That's what got us in trouble the last time. And that's okay. We don't have to read their comments. We'll just read the articles. What, are they, what can they say about that? And we'll snicker about it. And we'll read things that contradict other things. To show that they don't even know what they're talking about. So, have a great day everybody. Try to stay positive. Uh, we are becoming a remnant. We are fast becoming a very small group of people. By the time this is all said and done, there's probably going to be 5% of us left. 5%. So, hopefully it'll be closer to 10%. But we were told that the gate is narrow. And it's really narrowing very, very quickly because it's not about just the poker or the sticker. That's symbolic of something else, isn't it? It's not just about the poker and the sticker. It's symbolic of a mindset of people that have chosen to serve the master that they're serving. And that's what worries me. It's a symbolic of the mindset of those who believe the lie and those who do not. It's a, it's a symbolic of the mindset of those who have faith and those who do not. Those who give into the fear and those who don't. So, have a great day, everybody. Take care.